Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I can see by the puzzled expressions on some of your faces, why is Scott standing up in front of you dressed in full Scottish regalia? It's because in order to prepare for this presentation, I had to talk to hundreds of people that had been killed and brought back to life again. Thank you. Just to let you know, the pre that's the highlight of the presentation. Down from here. Little trivia. Um, in Scotland, uh, the men wear kilts, and each kilt has its own family, or each clan has its own uh, family plaid. And in honor of this week, I'm wearing the Monroe tartan. So. There we have it. <clears throat> so thank you all for coming. And a special thank you to two gentlemen, Bob Monroe, who in 1971 wrote Journeys Out of the Body, where he coined the term out of body experience. And in that book, he described the non-physical universe. And in that non-physical universe, he said there were distinct locales. And each one of those locales, if you went to visit it, you would have a similar experience to those who had visited that same place previously. Raymond Moody, in 1975, collected a series of stories uh, from people who had near-death experiences. And he got to coin the term near-death experience. In that book, he described that folks that had this and we're exploring the non-physical universe, discovered that there were distinct locales. And if you went to these locales, you would have a similar experience to those who had come previously. So it is my objective and my intent today to show, to demonstrate to you, and I hope you'll get it by the end, that we have a similar pattern here, that even though Bob Monroe and Raymond Moody are using different cosmologies different ways of talking about the non-physical universe, they are indeed very similar. So what I'm going to do today um, is in four parts. The first part is that I'd like to tell you my story. One, so that you get to know me a little bit better, but also because I think it's important for you to know what lens I'm using when I approach this work. The second is that I'm going to briefly talk about the cosmology of uh, the Monroe Institute and Bob Monroe. I know many of you know this very well. Some of you know it intimately. Uh, but it's helpful, I think, to breeze through it and to listen to the kinds of words that I'm using to describe it. The bulk of my time is going to be describing what happens during a near-death experience. And then I will end my presentation by talking about my cousin, Kathy Tao Lynch, and in, discussing, in describing her transition, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see how these two different cosmologies weave together to create a sense of um, what her gift was to me and to all of us, this gift of overcoming the fear of death. I was in love with Mary, Fran, and Nolan. In 1981, they were involved in a horrific car accident. Mary, Fran was killed instantly, and Nolan, who had just turned seven, uh, sustained a mortal head injury, and uh, the two of them were taken from the scene of the accident to Rochester, Mayo, in Minnesota and received very good care. Um, and it took Nolan about five days before he made his transition. Mary Fran was third in a family of nine. Uh, Nolan was the eldest grandchild. And I'm telling you all this because it's, it's important to the scene which I would like to set for you. And that is because it took five days um, 
for Nolan to, to make his transition, there was plenty of time for um, Mary Fran's uh, brothers and sisters to come, for the aunts and uncles, the grandparents, the spouses, the boyfriends and girlfriends, the cousins, friends of the family, my family, uh, to come to the hospital and maintain a vigil. And as you can imagine, with all of those people, uh, when, the, when the nurse finally came in at about six in the morning and said that it was time, there was quite a few of us. And we filed into this small hospital room. And by the time I got in, um, it was about four deep around his hospital bed. And there really wasn't any place for me to go. So Willie, uh, Mary Fran's youngest brother, and I wound up sitting on a windowsill and waiting. And those of you that have attended people who've made their transition, um, well, at least in this case, um, it was, it's slow. And it's not like the movies, you know? It's very, it was very gentle. And I really couldn't see Nolan because of all of the people, but you know, you could certainly see the monitor. And you just, you just watch and, and wait. And you know, eventually the, the monitor goes to flat line. And when that happened, what I experienced was that Mary Fran, who had died five days before, um, came and scooped Nolan up out of his physical body. And they had this exquisite reunion, as only you could imagine a mother and child might have. And then to my surprise, the two of them turned to me, embraced me, and then the three of us went to the light. Now, this is where it gets weird. <laughs> because I was fully conscious with them in the light, and I was fully conscious in the room with all of the other relatives. So I had bilocated. And it was, yeah, let's just leave it at it was unusual. Um, but as I, begin, as I began to enter the light, what happened for me was that I entered this dimension of joy and ecstasy and love and requited longing that was almost beyond my ability to handle it. I was in this dimension where there was um, just rapture and unity and reunion. I know that I was in my physical body in the room because I was supremely aware that Nolan had just made his transition and the room was filled with people who were grieving. They were crying, they were hugging each other and being consoled and consoling. And I was, I had such joy, such ecstasy that I had to have a grin on my face that was out to here someplace. And as you can imagine, it was entirely inappropriate for the room. And so, you know, I wound up covering my, my face with my hands and stayed that way for as long as I was in that space of being in the light and being in the room. And eventually, the different parts of myself came together. What was it, a minute, two minutes, five? I'm not exactly sure. Time gets a little funky right around then. <laughs> so after it was over, all I could think of was, what just happened? I don't, what just happened? Um, let's just say it's not part of the lexicon of the Presbyterian church that I grew up in. <laughs> 
a very Scottish institution where they are tour. <laughs> um, you know, we, we just didn't talk about things like bilocation and death as ecstasy. It's, it just wasn't part of who I was. And so I was completely set adrift from anything that made sense to me. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't talk about it for 20 years. Um, so one of the things we know about people that have near-death experiences is very often they will go on a spiritual search. And that happened to me. Uh, not that it was a coordinated thing, like I'm going to find out the secret of life and go visit all of the ancient sites in Peru and Egypt and Greece and Turkey and Italy and England and Japan. I worked with people, shamans in South America and North America. I attended a seminary in New York. I was trying to touch that space again. I really wanted to touch that space again and I was looking for a way to do that and somebody must know how. 1983, a friend of mine introduces me to the Monroe Institute. I come. I take my gateway, and I have my socks blown off. I was able to touch that space again, and I discovered that while here, I could have a similar and more varied experience than that brief moment in Nolan's hospital room, that I could have experiences here by design that were repl replicable and under my control as much as we can be under control here at TMI. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I wanted to touch that space again. And flash forward a couple more years, I become a facilitator at, at the Monroe Institute here in 1985, helping people to discover the myriad of experiences that you can have that are our birthright. And so you could touch that space here. And one of the things that I learned early in my time here at Monroe Institute, um, I have to say, I got very humble because I discovered I was not exceptional. <laughs> it wasn't just me that could have this extraordinary experience, but everybody can have that experience. And it involves remembering and waking up and discovering that for ourselves. Flash forward another 10 years, and I started to get serious about my search, really serious. I entered a doctoral program at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. And if you don't know that university, it's the largest private university in Minnesota. It was started about and modeled after Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. So that gives you kind of a, an anchor there. Um, educational leadership was the program, and my dissertation topic was on people who had near-death experiences. And those of you that have gone through that process know that it has you know, several distinct points that happen along the way, the first one of which is the literature search. And so I started reading all that had been written about near-death experiences, and I discovered this little bitty book by PMH Atwater, which was extraordinary. Well, it was extraordinary because she doesn't write little bitty books. She always writes big fat ones. But in this little book, way in the back, there was one paragraph four sentences long, and in it, it said something like, there are those people who, when attending somebody who's making their transition, will share that death experience with them and go to the light with the departing soul. Oh my God. I'm not sure whether I was hit by a sledgehammer or knocked over with a feather. All of a sudden, I discovered that what had happened to me had a name. Because why would I ever think I had a near-death experience? Because up till then, what I knew about near-death experiences was 
that you had to die. I mean, your body had to be so compromised with injury that it died and it was only the miracle of modern medicine that brought you back. That isn't what happened to me. I was sitting on a windowsill grieving. So now I'm hooked. And I really am pursuing this now with not only an academic interest, but oh my gosh, this was me. I can understand this. So a little bit farther in the process, uh, you get to interview people. And as fate would have it, um, Mary Fran's sister uh, had had a near-death experience and let it be known that she wanted to be interviewed. So we sat down one afternoon and we did that. And her experience was that she left her physical body, she wound up in this world of white, and there was Mary Fran standing there. And her sister, upon seeing her, just was overjoyed and ran to her with her arms opened up. And Mary Fran looked at her, pointed her finger, and said, no, you're going back. <laughs> to which her sister looked at her and said, well, nice to see you too, Mary Fran. <laughs> I was hoping for a, like a joyful reunion. And Mary Fran just looked at her and said, no, you're going back. Boom. Done. Just like that. By the way, that was very Mary Fran. <laughs> very direct. Um, so we finished with the interview and then um, we're just chit-chatting about the family and kind of catching up because I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I finally screwed up my courage and asked her, did anything unusual happen when you were in the hospital room when Nolan made his transition? And her eyes got just huge, just like saucers. And she looked at me and said, it just kind of nodded her head. And she said, and you? I said, yeah. So I tell you what, you tell me your experience first and then I'll tell you mine. So her sister then related this story to me, which in essence went, when Nolan flatlined, Mary came, Mary Fran came, scooped Nolan out of his body and they had an exquisite reunion. The two of them then turned to her, embraced her, and the three of them went to the light. We were wrong. There weren't three people that went to the light, there were four. Mary Fran, Nolan, me, and her sister. Independent confirmation of a shared near-death experience. I'm now really hooked. I have got to figure out what this is about. Well, thank goodness the International Association of Near-Death Studies exists. Dan Corcoran, president, thank you very much. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> they have outstanding conferences coming up over Labor Day. <laughs> Every year, please go. Um, so I became involved with IANS and um, went to their conferences. I got elected to the board and served as their treasurer, and I have had the distinct pleasure over the last six years of moderating the international convention. I got to talk to hundreds of people who'd had near-death experiences, and I'm starting to get it, to understand what's going on. Okay, because I am a professor, I cannot do this without handouts. You have one already that kind of summarizes what's going on. Bob Holbrook, I need you now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be handing out one more, and, and it is a listing, this, this little worksheet I have for you. On the left-hand side, are all of this, the states of consciousness, not all of them, but a nice representation of the states of consciousness that people at the Monroe Institute encounter. 
On the right hand side, there are the common elements of a near-death experience. And your job is to match the two of them up as I talk. Right? So this is a little activity here. So you get the idea. One, <clears throat> on the right-hand column, there is one of the neat things about near-death experiences is you get to come back to your physical body. One of the nice things about being here at TMI, if you have an out-of-body experience, you get to come back to your physical body. That's why N goes to N. Get it? You can draw a line, you can put them in here. And the reason that I'm calling it a quiz is that embedded in my presentation today, there will be uh, prizes. If you get uh, one of the matches correct, uh, you get to have a Andy's Mint wrapped in St. Patrick's Day green. They'll be back there in the bowl. Third prize is a hundred grand and an extra payday. I'm not kidding. A hundred grand and an extra payday. Second prize is PMH Atwater's book, The Big Book of Near-Death Experiences. This is the best introduction to near-death experiences I have ever read. I don't even think there's a number two. So I will, whoever has the correct answer to my quiz will get that one. Number, the first prize, of course, is this wonderful CD, which has a near-death, four near-death experience meditations undergirded with hemisync to take you to exactly the same spots. I love that unsolicited. <laughs> and just so you know, the music on here is by John Sari. It's beautiful. So I was very privileged to be have that done by Monroe Products, and they did a great job. So you get the idea? Well, you got to match stuff up, you know? OK. Everybody got the idea about how this is going to go? All right, so this. This next process here is we're going to do a quick review of the left-hand column, the cosmology of Bob Monroe and what he discovered when he uh, viewed the non-physical universe. And essentially what he said was that when you're in the non-physical universe, you can focus your attention on different vibration levels. And when you do that, you get to encounter uh, uh, different types of experiences along the way, and there's the whole list. The preparatory process is designed to engage us with our non-physical energy body. So the surf connects us with that energy, the energy conversion box clears that energy, the resonant tuning raises it, the resonant energy balloon directs that energy, and the affirmation creates the quality of energy that we can use to attract or repel whatever it is that we want. And then we get to that special state called focus 10, which is mind awake and body asleep. And here we begin to manipulate the non-physical universe using tools like uh, the energy bar tool, dolphin energy healing, and we get to have a uh, put anchors out in the non-physical universe. So if we have a really interesting experience, we can create a, an anchor and go back to that anytime we want. Case in point, for me, when I want to go to focus 12, it's a lily pad. So I envision this lily pad, plunk myself on it, and I'm now in focus 12, the state of expanded awareness. And in this state, um, our physical sensations are turned way down, and that we begin to have new ways of, of perceiving the universe, like, remember, uh, Scooter was talking about rotes and thought balls and telecommunication. Uh, we begin to understand that the language in the non-physical universe is metaphorical and comes in symbols. Psychic and clairvoyant functioning happens as a natural course of things and that we begin to understand our inner guidance. Maybe we call it uh, subconscious, higher self, inner resource, something like that. And then we get to focus 15, which is a really special state uh, one in which you can go and visit things anytime and any when. And then there is that special state of, uh, that we call the void, which is this totally black space, maybe tinged with a little purple around the edges. 
And in it, we begin to discover what it's like to just be. And that in certain meditations, meditation traditions, um, it's that sense of one-pointedness. You've heard that expression. That is focus 15. And it also has this characteristic of, um, of manifestation. It is the state where things exist before form. And it, all it takes is our desire, our intention, and we throw that out in 15, and 15 responds by bringing that into reality. And then there's the Maranon color run, where each one of the focus levels between 15 and 21 has a color associated with that. And when we lead people through this during the gateway, um, we ask that they uh, experience each one of those colors multi multisensorily. That's a word. So in other words, does blue have a, the blue of 15 have a smell, a taste? Does it have a texture? Is there a sound? Is there music associated with it? What is the experience of all, of each one of these? And, and my favorite are people who describe this experience as, as going down through the middle of, of a lifesaver roll. Right, and they kind of just experience each of the colors as they, as they move through the center of it. With a special stop off at Focus 18. And here is where we discover that the very matrix of the universe, the undergirding fabric, is love. And here we discover that um, we can connect with that through our heart chakra at Focus 18. And Focus 21 is the bridge state, that meeting place between the physical and non-physical worlds. And here, it's all about communication. It's about now being in a place where communication can happen between physical and non-physical bodies that make sense. This is a really, this is a spot where you can do that. And we're talking about um, loved ones, people who have been physical or never have been physical. And this is uh, my favorite, one of my favorite places to hang out, uh, when you're there at the Bridge Cafe, I am underneath the yellow umbrella, not very far from the tap where they are doing red wine. Okay, that's where you find me, yellow umbrella next, next to the wine. This is also the state Bob talked about where each of us have the ability to be in each of the focus levels. There's some part of us that exists, and this was easiest for him to be the eye there, he had he had the best job of discovering or entering into a conversation with himself in, in Focus 21. 22 and 23 is that area of confusion. Think Patrick. Think the young man who was blown up in a boat and he was so petrified that his non-physical body held on to the detritus that was left of the explosion, and he couldn't recognize um, non-physical help. He couldn't see the light because of his fear. In focuses 24 through 26, uh, this is the belief system territories. Last night, Bill talked about this at, at some level, but he used different words. Remember he talked about how when you leave your physical body, you will find that area that is most similar to what you know. And can't we do better than that? It was kind of the general message that he had. Um, this, is, this is it. And this is where um, there are as many spots here as there have been cultures in our history. And so that you can leave this, this physical world and find a place that is very comfortable, very similar to what you left so that you can spend a little time there, either because that's where you want to be, or it's kind of like a, a debrief. You get to hang out for a little bit before you move on. If I'm going to hang out, here's a little more into Scott, um, I'm going to have a library that looks kind of like that. <laughs> and it's going to have that ladder with the little wheelie thing on it, you know? And I'm going to have a big roaring fire, a leather chair, and off to the right is going to be a crystal glass with a finger of Lefroy, 25-year-old Scotch whiskey. <laughs> Touch of water, no ice. And the time to read. 
right? That's kind of my idea of what the belief system territories is all about. And you know that I love the sport of curling. Some of the most fabulous curlers in the world were in the 1960s when I was learning. That's what we looked like back then. Yahoo! That's kind of what I look like now. I curl in my kilt. It weirds out my competition. <laughs> that is not I, however. I'm left-handed, this guy's right-handed, but you know, he's got pretty good form there. And no, you can't look up his guilt. <laughs> Di Diane, that was naughty. Okay, focus, 27. They call this, Bob called this the park. Oddly enough, because when you get there, there is a park. And fields of flowers and trees, and you get to meet with loved ones, and there's a reception center, a center of healing and regeneration, learning. Uh, you can create your own center, but what is really extraordinary about this particular state is, is this where, is where you really get to understand how everything is connected to everything else. That there is this sense of unity in the universe where... You know, we have um, this sense of, in the physical world, it's all about me being different than you, this dualism. Not so. What you learn here is that the non-physical universe is run by different rules, and that's one of them, that we are connected with everything else. And then there's a series of after effects. This is Will, who just came down to the debrief after learning for the very first time Focus 15. Hey, Will, how did it go? So often we get this goldfish look. You know? There's words forming, but nothing comes out. That's pretty much what a debrief for Focus 15 looks like. So there's parts of what we do that are really ineffable here. It's hard to describe. And some people have some really sacred experiences here that they find difficult to explain to other people. Value changes. We know there's this wonderful study that was done some time ago that showed that if you attend three programs here at the Monroe Institute, that the values from which you live your life change and change permanently. And part of that is because we really, truly begin to understand what Bob was telling us, and that is to not be afraid of death because we are more than our physical bodies. We get that. And very often when we have out-of-body experiences, we can cooperate that with the physical world. What do we know about near-death experiences? All right, I'm going to violate the professor's first rule of slides. Sorry. <laughs> Did you know, I mean, there is a rule. They've done studies on this. Seven words is what you should have on a slide. OK. John Dewey, who is the father of modern experiential education, spent a lot of time talking about how do you look at problems. And, and he called what near-death experiences um, as an ill-defined problem which means that you can take data and two people can look at the same series of data and, go and come up with different answers. That's okay, and I totally get that. But what I'm gonna to present to you here in the next little bit is that um, I think the preponderance of evidence is what I'm gonna be showing you. In fact, I think it's the vast preponderance of evidence. So when I take a look at, at it, that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you. And the last thing is that when I talk about what happens in a near-death experience, please um, take it with a grain of salt. Is that the right word? I'm not sure. But it doesn't come out as whole cloth. So somebody will describe something that happened to them in a near-death experience, and somebody else will describe it, and another person, 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 and another person. And when all of a sudden, when you get a lot of data, you go, wow. There's a pattern here. It didn't come out that way whole cloth. 
it came out in pieces, and that's the job of researchers, is to try to, try to make sense out of all of this, this, this data that comes out. Okay, so onward we go. So this part's, this next part has three bits to it. I want to, I want to tell you what the resources I brought to this. I want to tell you what the common elements of a near-death experience, and I may be a couple of quick stats at the end. So at some point, there should be some of you looking at me here in the audience going, okay, did Scott read a couple of books and is like telling me a story here, or, or is there some substance to it? Well, there have been 41 scientific studies that have been done. Um, I have read every single journal article in um, the IN's uh, scientific peer-reviewed journals from 1975 through 2012. I'm still working on 12 to 15. Um, there have been 33 US studies in six Western countries. Uh, most of the studies have been done are Western. There's a couple of Eastern, not Eastern, non-Western uh, studies. Um, there's a small number of books, and when I'm talking about books here, I'm not talking about, there's a zillion books out there that have anecdotal stories. I'm talking about those that have approached near-death experience from a, a, a disciplined scientific perspective. And all in all, I have studied the cases of over 300 3,300 near-death experiencers. And this one is my most difficult case. <laughs> All right, let me tell you about Dr. Raymond Moody. In 1975, he wrote this book, Life After Life, and essentially what he did was he took this big red flag and he stuck it in the ground and he said, hey, something really important is happening here. And what I want, world, what I want you to do is to go investigate it. Because he said, I think I found something that is part of our human condition and we all ought to know about it and we ought to start working on it. Well, that was 40 years ago, 40 years ago, like next month. So it's, let's just say we know a lot more now about near-death experiences, what caused them, what are the elements, and how do people live with what they know than we did 40 years ago. But he's the guy who saw the pattern and had the courage to print it up. We have a tremendous resource here really close to us. His name is Dr. Bruce Grayson. And he was at the University of Virginia and just recently retired. Please, let me read you his, um, his title. Bruce Grayson, MD, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia Medical School. He was director of the Division of Perceptual Study, professor of psychiatric medicine in the Department of Psychiatric Medicine Division of Outpatient Psychiatry at UVA, he was also editor of the Journal of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, and he was the most prolific researcher into near-death experiences from a medical perspective that's out there. This guy needed something to do. Wow, he got all that done. And what he said, uh, kind of what his mission turned out to be was that people would come up with ideas, like a near-death experience is lack of oxygen to the brain. And he would scratch his chin and go, I wonder how we could design an experiment to prove or disprove that. And he would do that. And then somebody else would come up and say, hey, what about hallucinations? And he would go and investigate that. How about endorphin or drug reactions? And my favorite, memories from birth. Go to the light. <laughs> Dreams, God spot, that special state of psychosis called the personalization. He tested them all and said, that's not it. And he continue, had continued to do that up until he just retired. This is what it is. 
This is my second failure, sorry, way too many words. But let me, let me read it to you because this is the working definition that IONS uses. Reported memories of a profound psychological event with certain common paranormal, transcendental, and mystical features that occurred during a special state of consciousness associated with a pause, actual, or threatened. Threatened. You don't have to die, you just think you might die. Cars racing towards you, you jump out of the way, but the only thing that jumps is your, your non-physical body, and then the car swerves out of the way and nothing actually happened, but you did have a near-death experience. Actual or threatened physical, psychological, emotional, or spiritual death that were fo followed by certain common after effects. Okay. Here's the common elements of near death experiences. Scott, we've got a question here. Yes, sir. Can you go back and list those four things again? Sure. Physical, psychological, emotional, or spiritual death. that were followed by certain common after effects. That's a big deal, by the way. That's one of the measuring sticks you can use is, because I've interviewed people that have absolutely no memory, absolutely no memory of the accident and what happened, but they are a poster child for the after effects. Yeah. I don't understand. Could you give an example of spiritual death? Um, God doesn't love me. I am outside of anything that makes any sense, and I am just going to wither away. They're in, in that state of bereft. There's no attachment to anything larger than themselves, and there's no purpose to life. Why am I here? Kind of something on that order. Does that make sense? Um, Raymond Moody. So here again, I just want to reemphasize this point one more time, that when we're talking about near-death experiences, there, um, I'm going to be using English language, which just by its very nature is sequential. Uh, it doesn't have to be sequential. Um, nobody has all of the elements. Uh, in fact, you only need one of these elements to be um, a near-death experiencer. And each case is absolutely unique. So here's the, here's the common elements. The first one is, this is really hard to talk about. It, like what happened to me with Nolan, it was so, out, like they say in Scotland, is so outside my ken that I don't, there's no place to put it into, there's no cubby hole that fits in my life. I don't know what to do with it. There's no really good English words to describe what happens. And then there's the other part of this, which I should mention. Sometimes the experience is so sacred, so wonderful, that people don't want to put words around it because words put boundaries on things. They put definitions on things. And some people, me included, I didn't want to touch the experience by describing it in words. So there's that too. This is my favorite. It's only the second element, it's my favorite. Hearing oneself pronounced dead. So picture the scene. You're in a hospital room. You're on, a, you're on the gurney in the emergency room. And as described to me by one of my interview people, uh, a big male nurse is standing over the, the gurney. And he says, I think we've lost him. And the person's laying on the gurney looking around going, what? This is a really small room. How can you lose anybody in here? <laughs> but this is that special states of consciousness where your mind is bright, awake, and clear, and your body is dead. Just saying. But... If you have the presence of mind at this point, what you would discover is that your, your senses have heightened, that you can see, that you can hear. Everything has been turned up a notch. The folks who describe this say that this is the dream, and that what happens is that we wake up from the dream of the physical, 
into this state. And then there's this state where the body becomes so filled with energy, swirling energy, that you begin to hear it. You can hear the energy, and it, and it, and it comes out as a loud buzzing or, or a ringing noise. Not everybody has that, but some do. And then here, physical body, non-physical body, inhabiting the same space. With me? And then what seems to happen right now is that they move out of phase with each other. And the second that the non-physical body and the physical body move out of phase, all of the signals stop. So the person who is in the gurney at the accident scene doesn't feel pain anymore. They can relax. They can actually enjoy the scene or um, just, just be there and not be afraid of things. Um, they find it pleasant, peaceful, and with a sense of well-being. And one that we know real well around here is that the physical body <laughs> then separates <laughs> and floats up. And it can be sideways, it can be up, it can be down, you know. But the interesting thing about this, for me, as a researcher, is that when people are describing this scene, they are, there's, there's not this sense of, oh my God, what's happening? This is just so weird. It's not like that. This is normal. This is, this is like, oh. And if anything kicks in, it's one of two states. One is curiosity. And it most often shows up with think accident scene. And, you know, a guy's floating above his body, and he's going, huh, that's my buddy Fred working on me. Boom, boom, boom. Male pattern baldness. I never noticed he had that before. <laughs> yeah. there's, no, there's no trauma. There's no what's going on with me. In this... In this state, um, there are, um, our perceptual powers change. So we're talking about 360 degree vision. We're talking about the ability to hear things that are a mile away. We're talking about uh, telescopic vision. I can see things very close. Uh, so all of that is incorporated into this state and it's not unusual. It seems to be our home state and we're very comfortable being there. Okay, we separated from the physical body and now we're gonna talk about the tunnel. So, so somewhere in, usually it happens in the corner of a room. There's something sacred about corners that the air itself then forms into a tunnel and you know as the departing soul, that's where you're supposed to go. There's a bright light at the end of the tunnel and you know that you're supposed to go there. And people who do that, usually they fly through this tunnel and go there as fast as they can. And the light is calling them and it is just something that they wanna be with and it's just, in fact, they go so fast they talk about the wind going against their face and going through their hair. Interesting concept. I don't think there's any air out there. <laughs> All this is, of course, unless you've done this once before. Now, I've been a trainer here for a long time. And I probably heard Joe McMonagall talk, what, 50 times? And in, and actually, Joe, I pay attention. When, when you talk, and in his second near-death experience, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, he decides to not rush down the tunnel because there's, he already knows what the light is, and he's been there, and he knows you know, where it's going to go, and so what's the rush? So he taught me a new word, which was saunter. Let's just saunter down the tunnel. 
Because as you can saunter down the tunnel, all of a sudden you begin to discover that this is a magnificent place. There is sound and color and lights. There is extraordinary music. And if you touch the walls, they morph. And there are colors there that don't exist on the physical plane. Now, this is what happens when you have unusual friends who would like to give you a tunnel experience. I got this slide because I, I knew that my, my roommate, Dick Whirling, that looks a lot like you, sorry man. <laughs> Thought I'd warn you. <laughs> okay. All right. Next, through the tunnel, we're going to experience the light. At the end of the tunnel is the thing that changed my life, the most extraordinary experience is this experience with the light. It is unconditional love times billions. It, it, the light itself is so bright. Uh, people talk about it as being a million billion suns. But it is so bright that it doesn't even hurt your non-physical eyes. You can be in this light. Uh, so it's comfortable to look at. And it's a little, it's not like light on earth in that there's a source that shoots to you like this. It's like when you step into the light, you are absorbed by the light. So you're not different from the light. You are part of the light. And I've had so many people say, well, you can call it the light, but just call it love. You enter the love. Now here's a part that's not well known, is that there are three kinds of light. This is the one that's most popular because it's really easy to put on the media. You know, the white light at the end of the tunnel. You know, it's on the cover of my CD, all right. I'm going with that. But there are two other kinds, clear and black. This is one of my favorite scenes from What Dreams May Come. That's the back of Robin Williams. And this is, I think, a perfect description of what clear light is. Clear light differs because what it does is everything is alive and radiates the light. Different than coming here. This way, everything radiates the light. And again, there are colors in this light that don't exist here on the, on the physical plane. And black light black with purple tedges. Um, the people who experience this talk about shelter. They talk about nurturing. And almost every single person that I know that has had a black light experience does a, a gesture. Folded arms like this. They talk about being so nurtured, so held, so loved. They talk about it as being the womb of God. And then you come to this field. And in this field, this is my field. You're going to have a different field, but this is mine. It's full of flowers. There's a lake in the background with some mountains and trees. So this is my field. Any of you want to uh, see the movie Gladiator and haven't yet? Got a spoiler alert coming up. OK. In the movie Gladiator, at the very end, when the emperor murders Russell Crowe, Russell Crowe goes through the gates, and he finds himself in his field. It's a field of wheat that exists on his farm. And in this field are his family. 
that have passed on previously. Here, in this, in this field, in this, what researchers call the park, the very first thing that seems to happen is this. A reunion, a reunion with loved ones. And it's not just, yo, fist bump. You know, yeah. Nice to see you back here. It's this kind of stuff. It's like, we have missed you. It is so wonderful that you are here. Oh, I can't wait to catch up. You know, that kind of experience. Just so happy and people jumping up and down. It's just great. And then your grandparents, the ones that love ballroom dancing, here they are. They don't, yeah. they don't look like when you last saw them in the hospital bed with tubes up their nose, they look like this. And they're dancing in their living room. And they're having just the best time. And there's your pet that you owned when you were 12 years old. And some people experience, at this point, um, experiences with divine figures. So it could be Mother Mary. It could be Jesus. It could be Buddha. It could be your totem. It could be, name it. It depends on what culture you come from. What would give you the most solace and comfort right now? And then in this area, as you pass through the light into the park, you become acquainted with a world of unlimited knowledge. Remember we talked about unity, where everything is connected to everything else? This is the spot. And you become aware that everything is available to you. And I love this tapestry, and I wish I could find the name. I just I Googled it, and I'm trying to find a reference on it. But this is great. I mean, knowledge is represented by a woman reading a book. It's safe. There's a wall around here. It's nurturing. There's food on the table. There's children. There's people playing. There's animals. There, I, this is a an angel if you want them. It is this extraordinary place that, is, that has universal love and unity. Back to my buddy, Russell Crowe. At the beginning of Gladiator, he has this amazing scene where he's extolling the troops before they go into battle. And he says this, if you find yourself alone riding in green fields with sun on your face, do not be troubled for you are in Elysium and you are already dead. <laughs> the point of this is the concept of heaven and the afterlife and what happens. It is not Christian. It is as old as human beings and in every culture that I know of, there is some form of afterlife. appearing before a being of light. So you've, you're in the park, and met all those flowers, and out of the ether forms this being of light. And if you're a child, very, not, very often this being has wings. And if you're not, uh, meaning you're an adult, uh, very often it does not. It appears as a being of light. Uh, more pure peer-to-peer, -peer. and the being of light is extraordinary from the standpoint that it is the embodiment of compassion. That because we are in the land of unity, there are no secrets, and this being can look at you, feel you, be you. This is where language gets hard. And find all those dark places that are within your soul and fill them with light. This being has the ability and near-death experiences as a, as a whole, not everyone, but as a whole, tend to be healing experiences. And this is one of the places where that happens most profoundly. Because it's the job of this being of light, which people, adults tend to call it something like teacher protector. They don't call it an angel, some do, but it had, usually there's a languaging around teacher protector. As they lead us on a life review, here is what it is not, okay? It is not this, although put this on your bucket list. This is a very funny movie. The, 
defending your life. I just love it. But more often, what you're likely to do is to find yourself in a space where, OK, there's lots of variations on a theme here, but picture this. You're in a space that's white. And in this space, you find little balls of light. Think lava lamp, right? Different color balls are floating around. And your attention is drawn to one of them. And immediately, you're in a scene of your life. And you get to replay that scene as yourself, fully formed. Seeing, hearing, touching all of the senses. You get to know what you're thinking. You get to know the, your emotions. You get to relive this intact. You with me? OK. Number two is you get to relive this scene as the other. So picture you know, a brief little scene at the grocery store, and the, woman, the young girl who's running the cash register isn't getting it. right? And that's the scene that's played out. So you get to be the girl. And you get to discover that this is her first day. And she's very nervous. And her boss hasn't trained her because he's too busy because Fred didn't show up in the meat department. You, know, you get to know all that stuff. And then you get to view it again simultaneously from a third perspective, an omniscient perspective, that looks at this scene and says, this is how it impacted the two of you. And then your workplace, your family, your community, and maybe humanity, depending upon the importance of the scene. So you get to relive all of that. So the role of the light being is to love your way through this experience. Because some of these scenes are going to be tough. As you're saying to yourself, oh, I was a jerk. But that's OK. Because this, this being is designed to be there and love you and to provide guidance and to point out things that maybe you hadn't noticed before. But most often what they do is they ask you one question. What did you learn from this experience? Think about Bill last night. What did you learn? What awareness, what spiritual attention did you have when you were having this experience? Okay. Now. Since you are all advanced souls, I know that because you are here. <laughs> all of this experience, we all know, because everything is interconnected with everything else. But you can enhance the spiritual experience of all of this if you take advantage of one thing. And that's when you're having your life review, and you get to see this scene, and it's over with, and you can turn to your teacher protector and say, what if I had said to that young girl, oh, this is your first day. You know what? I had a first day at work, too. And you can always fix the paperwork. Take a deep breath, relax, do it again, and, we'll, and you'll get it right. Don't worry. What if I'd said that? What would have happened to that relationship, our family, our community? How would that have played out? And not only that, you could ask A, B, C. What if I'd done all different kinds of things? And you can actually write history. These things really happen. Now, this is where it gets a little goofy. Not goofy, but think multiple universes, right? So you're saying, OK, what if I'd done that? I just moved over into a parallel universe where that scene really did happen. And you get to watch it play out. This is where it gets, your mind starts getting a little goofy. But it allows us to exponentially increase our human experience by challenging what it is that we did and creating alternatives and saying to them, what happens when? OK. All right, here we go. Here's the problem. The problem is sequence. Time. I just alluded to it. But when I'm talking about time, you know, and looking at all these different bubbles and entering different scenes of your life, they don't happen sequentially. It's that fast. All of them happening at the same time that fast. All of those alternate universes, alternate scenarios, 
in an instant. You know, when they talk about life flashing before your eyes, it's a real deal. Okay, so here's my nod to sacred scripture. This is a little off. This is a sidebar here, but this is when I nod to the folks that believe in creationism and say, if you are trying to write a sacred text and you write it from the perspective of somebody going through a life review and you understand that time exists as an instant, always, there is no time, beginning and end, from that perspective, it makes sense. So when you start to read sacred scripture, you know, my admonition is, where are they coming from? What part of the non-physical universe may some adept, some monk sitting somewhere, who's having this experience go, you know, the only way I can write this thing down is from that perspective, because from here it doesn't make sense. But I can only tell what happened to me. So just, just a little pause there. Now, I have to tell you about why this is the mo one of the most important things that happens in a, in a near-death experience, this idea of a past life review, because of a woman named Martha. I interviewed her and self-described she was a despicable human being. Horrible. Awful. She was one of 12 children, and her favorite thing to do was at family gatherings to see how long it would take to get everybody screaming at everybody else by telling half-truths, innuendos. And so when she had her past life review, she relived it as herself, but she relived it as the 60 other people in this room, plus 61. And she was horrified, horrified at what had happened to her and what kind of a human being she would and why would she do such a thing? Just, it made no sense. So for her, that's the healing that took place. It came in the form of reliving some of these scenes. And in her case, when she came back, she made a vow that she would make amends with her 11 siblings. And the last time I talked to her, uh, she'd done reasonably well with nine and two, still wouldn't talk to her. This is, you know, decade later. So, but the intention is there, and maybe she'll get that done, maybe she won't. But her life is better now because of this kind of thing. Okay, border. At some point, there's a border where you will have to make a decision. If I go into this land, whoops, there we go. If I cross this river, on the other side, this beautiful land, love, relatives, people who care for you, know you, you know that that's it that there's no re-entry into the physical. There's some kind of a decision that's made. And it can happen lots of different ways. That's for Jim Lane, right? Yeah, Jim Lane, it's you. Sometimes you get to say, the return is really quick. Sometimes it's uh, a replay. You know, you take the near-death experience and you just run it backwards until you're standing over your physical body and you can jump back in or are pushed in. Um, sometimes, you know, there is, um, you know, the teacher protector says, you know, it's not your time. And you have to go back. And you're going, uh-uh. It is really nice here. You know what's waiting for me back in physical? A body that is really beat up. It's got cancer, it hurts, it, why would I want to go back to that? Uh-uh, no way. And there's a big negotiation that takes place. Or the reverse, which is, it's time for you to come and to be with us. It happens especially with young mothers who say, no way is somebody else raising my infant and two-year-old. It's not happening. And some of the wildest rows you've ever heard about taking place between young mothers and teacher protectors. 
I had one mother tell me that she, you know, put her hands on her hip and she dug her, dug her heels into the cloud, and she wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> really? That's an interesting metaphor. Dug your heels into a cloud, that's going to do it. What did I do? Oh, yeah. Another stupid near-death experience. Here they thought they had a new recruit. Didn't happen. All right. People's reaction when they come back is very often anger. Why did you bring me back? It was so wonderful there. This nurse is going to get hurt. Her blouse grabbed in a second here. Or it might be profound states of sadness um, because they've lost that connection with the light, the love of God, the gifts of knowledge, and the presence of loved ones. Profound sadness over losing that connection. Then there's the folks that are just so blissed out. You know, it's just, they can't even talk. It's just so wonderful. Then there's the evangelicals who go around and say, God is the light. God is the light, and they want to spread the word. And it's not exactly true, but close enough. And then there's the folks like me who just, you know, can't talk about it. And then there's the common elements. Some people are afraid to talk about things because when they, the social structure they come back to doesn't accept that kind of thing. Some people come back and they have, they have a change in their values. Many become more spiritual and less religious. Not necessarily so, but we see that as a trend. I talked to a, a woman who said, we were talking about suicide, and she had a particularly lovely um, uh, experience, and I asked her if she ever considered suicide to go back to that place. And she said something so remarkable that I remember it to this day. She said, Scott, I have so much to do if I stay, but not before I go. Isn't that lovely? I have so much to do if I stay, but not before I go. Meaning this is a rich world that we live in. This physical experience gives us all kinds of opportunities to learn and grow and do what Bill talked about last night, focus our attention and, and be the being that we're supposed to be. But if the call comes, I'm on the bus. You know, no looking back is what she was telling me. And very often there's corroboration um, of, of what happened during um, their out-of-body state. Okay. Quick statistics. How many people have near-death experiences? There's been one study done in 1982 by the Gallup organization. At that time, they said about 5%. I do not believe that any longer. We are remarkably better at pulling people back um, in emergency rooms. Extraordinary what we can do now. And equally as extraordinary what we do on the battlefield. We can really pull our soldiers back from places that would have caused them um, uh, to die you know, certainly in my lifetime, way different than uh, Vietnam. So, who has a near-death experience? The answer is everybody. I don't care what it is you got going on, age, race, gender, social, economic status, whatever, whatever. Everybody. And does it make any difference how you die? The answer to this one is no. Every way that we can think of to stop the functioning of the human body is, is, is available to us as a near-death experience. The implication we've talked about now twice in previous lectures, and that is that we are, uh, the prevailing model as brain consciousness um, is going away. And the new model seems to be that our consciousness exists in our non-physical body, and that the brain is actually the translating organism, organ, between the non-physical and the physical. So when our non-physical self says, raise your left hand, it actually happens. All right. Two great books. PMH Atwater, which one of you will win shortly. Um, Ken Ring, 
fabulous. Um, he's the University of Connecticut, and this is, he wrote a whole series of books. This is the one that um, kind of takes his whole life and sums it up, his whole life of research. Lessons from the light. All right, I've got about 10 minutes, and I want to tell you about Kathy, because it's, it's important. My cousin Kathy uh, belongs in that side of my grandmother's side of the family. She was the eldest of nine in each one of the Tao family. Uh, they all had a passel of kids, so that side has, I have a zillion cousins. And I didn't know Kathy that well. And two years ago, I got a call from my Uncle PJ who said, um, Kathy is in hospice. She has terminal cancer. And he said, I went to visit her. And she's not afraid of dying. She's terrified of dying. And he said, Scott, you know about this death stuff, right? <laughs> Would you please go and talk to her? I said, sure. I'd be glad, be glad to go talk to her. So I went the next day. And I found Kathy, and she was kind of semi-sleeping, and I woke her up and reintroduced myself just to make sure she knew who I was and how we fit into the family. And I spoke very directly to her and said, Kathy, what's going on is that PJ called me yesterday and said that you were terrified of dying, and I have been where you are going, and it's wonderful. Would you like to talk about it? No. Oh, OK. This isn't exactly going how I thought it was going to go. So then came this moment of awkward silence as I'm trying to figure out what to do. And the Vikings game is on the television. And I'm looking at it going, this is a monumental waste of time. Not because the Vikings always lose, <laughs> but because, I mean, this is the most important transition in her life, and we're not talking, and I'm here. I've got to figure out a way. So when the commercial comes on, I start talking about the relatives that we have in common, and, you know, Uncle PJ, how's he doing, and his son Clark, and so we have this nice conversation, and it morphs into the, the relatives that we knew that had passed on. And like she knew my grandmother really well, and I never knew that. OK. And in the middle of that conversation, she looks at me right in the eye and says, OK. And taking that for a small sliver, I open the door and say, it's really wonderful there. Kathy, it's extraordinary. Is it? Yes. And so. Instead, there's this little voice in my head that said, don't butt up against your fears. Do something else. So I picked the only thing I could think of. Kathy, when you leave your physical body for the last time, who do you want to come and pick you up? And without a second's hesitation, she says, Uncle Ben. Well, and Aunt Muriel, too. But Uncle Ben, for sure. OK, great. Well, he's invited. Well, how, did, how do we know we invited him? And I said, well, when we talked about him, did you picture him here in the room? Yes. Was there emotion associated with that? Yes. He's invited. How do you know? Well, did you love Uncle Ben? Yes, I did. Did he love you? Well, yeah. Was he always there for you? Yes, you can trust that he will be for, there for you again. OK, so when you leave your physical body, would you please do me a favor? Because Uncle Ben is going to take you in a tunnel to the light. Would you saunter, please? <laughs> Don't go fast. You're going to want to go really fast to get to the light. But go slowly. It's filled with wonder. The lights. You know, and the music. And, and then when you get to the light, there's going to be a party. It's going to be a party, a welcome home party. And you get to invite the guests. Who do you want to show up? Well, we're into it now. 
I want mom and dad and uncle this and cousin that and how about pets? Yeah, I could do pets. Yes. Okay, so there's my dog Sally and Max and right cats. Yeah, there was a cat. Yeah. Okay, good. So we have the guests. Would you like the party inside or outside? I, I'd like it outside. Okay. Do you want it in the? Do you want it in a field or in trees? Well, actually, I want it in a little bit of both. That's why I picked this picture. How about a tent? Yes, I'd love a tent. Okay. Um, what do you want to eat? I want picnic food. I love picnic food. What does that mean? I want burgers, and I want baked beans with bacon, and I want uh, potato salad and coleslaw. Great. And then she got all deflated on me. Kathy, what? Does heaven have beer? <laughs> yes, heaven has beer. Yes. I could have beer. So, bugs. No bugs, she says. I don't want any bugs, so we're going to disinvite the bugs. Great. Tables, yes. Picnic or card table? Picnic tables. How about a runner? Yes, one of the long, narrow ones with primary stripes. And then on top of that, I want flowers in a glass vase that match the, the primary colors on the stripe. Music. Got somebody playing the guitar. That would be so cool. I love guitar music. How about games? No. I don't want games. Really, Kathy, that surprises me. How come? Because I want to see everybody. I want to catch up. I want to spend time. It'll be so nice to see them all. And then she looks at me straight in the eye and says, Scott, would you please leave? I am really, really tired. I'd be glad to. So I kissed her on the cheek and left. Got a call the next morning. She made her transition about 2 in the morning. So why did I tell you that story? It's because of the intersection of near-death experiences. I know them. I know what happens. So I could use that as, as building blocks to create comfort for her. And because I've been here at TMI, I know what you can construct in the non-physical universe. So I know that you can create trees and tents and primary colored stripes. I know that that happens. And there will be some time in your life when somebody reaches out to you and says, I need your help. I need you to help overcome my fear. And maybe it's around the experience of death, maybe it's not. But trust, because you were here at the Monroe Institute, and that you have done your studies and you have lived on this planet, that you will be ready, that you will be guided, to say the right words and lead them to some place of peace. They will be free. Thank you. But thank you, thank you.